Today we are going to talk to Dr. Anu Farnikar. He's a senior lecturer in the Department of Economics and Finance, a researcher. And then Dr. Anu, welcome. Thank you so much. So good to speak to you. Thank you, Malatori. Dr. Anu, can you please share with us how did you become a researcher? Yeah, well, I started at the university um, over or, or about 20 years ago. Um, and uh, initially I was very much into sports, playing rugby and also, you know, in for Shamlas and into the Cheetah group. But then, um, you know, actually when I started working on my master's degree, I started to really like uh, research a lot more. And uh, yeah, I, I uh, the university uh, offered me a position and uh, offered me an opportunity to do my PhD. So I think uh, uh, as part of my PhD, um, some of the research I did while I was in Washington um, at the IMF and the World Bank. And I think once you are there, your, your, your world opens up and you get to connect with so many top economists around the world in my field. And then, um, yeah, that really just stimulated so many things about, uh, you know, uh, the global economy that I'd like to uh, research on and especially globalization and all these things that were happening and uh, yeah it, it, it really uh, took my attention and it's quite exciting journey since then thank you doctor and currently what are you working on yeah so uh, um, a lot of my focus my field of expertise is international economics um, and especially global economic governance uh, linked to that but uh, recently, I've combined it with uh, uh, the basically uh, analyzing the principles and the fundamentals of an inclusive economy, uh, because it's a topic that's that's a word that's been mentioned, uh, you know, by governments and so many people, uh, even experts, but very few are, are clear on what exactly is an inclusive economy. So, uh, um, yeah. And it's also something that I feel is very relevant to Africa um, and part of how I believe Africa can rebuild itself and its own economy. And uh, it's also, you know, a, a way for the economy to bring society together, uh, to be uh, what I would call an instrument of healing in society, uh, because that's the power of the economy. So uh, inclusive economy is uh, uh, something that just draw my attention and uh, which I feel that can have a much deeper impact in the nation and the continent. Thank you, Doctor. And then when we, we look at the, the climate change, it has an impact on the world economy. Then is Africa ready with green trade and investment strategy? Well, it's a good question. Um, personally, I don't think Africa is, is quite ready. I mean, just South Africa's situation with ESCOM and going to green energy and how that is a struggle. We keep using coal and all other kinds of, uh, let's say, wrong energy sources uh, to generate electricity. Uh, it just shows you um, uh, there are structural challenges. Um, uh, what, what the, let's say the European countries and maybe even China is also going uh, in the green direction and some others, uh, the US, um, you know, is they've got a, um, almost like a backup system that can support that transition, um, going into green trade, green energy, green, um, all kinds of other production, which Africa struggled to have. And I think that's, that's the, 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 the issue that I think we, we are ready in terms of people want to, but, uh, um, you know, the, 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 um, there's not enough economic growth, economic development on a broader scale in order to support that. So we still depend on a lot of uh, non-green, uh, you know, to, to kinds of production and trade and uh, energy. So, uh, but I think uh, it's not a, it's inevitable that we will need to shift. Um, and I think the desire is there. Um, I think the key for Africa in how to do it is more collaboration. Uh, but more collaboration among African countries 
and a bit less dependent on the rest of the world. Okay, thank you very much, Doctor. And then looking at Rwanda, mm -hmm. the economy is now booming. Mm -hmm. what, what can we learn from Rwanda? Yeah, Rwanda is a, is an extremely good example of a um, uh, uh, transition. I mean, 1994, we were in opposite position. South Africa made a huge leap forward with a transition to a democratic society, while Rwanda had a, a civil war, you know, um, and at that stage, they had no hope uh, in terms of the future. But um, what was so beautiful to see is how the people got together. Um, after that war, they immediately started to rebuild that country. Um, and uh, that generated so much cohesion and, uh, you know, shared resources and the capacity to literally uh, pull it, uh, itself up by its own bootstrings. And of course, the moment that happens, international investment comes in and all kinds of, uh, you know, uh, external support, uh, which is necessary. Um, and I think that put the Rwanda on a completely different trajectory. Um, and also they addressed things like corruption and all the other things that, that we are now struggling with, you know. Um, and uh, they have good governance in place, they've got good economic growth in place. But I think the biggest benefit is uh, the willingness of the people to work together, to really uh, do things better. Uh, there is a sense of raising the standards the whole time. Um, I mean, if you go into Rwanda, you won't believe how neat it is, how orderly things are, how people are productive, um, how everybody cares about their communities, um, and even, you know, the leaders, uh, they serve. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, I think once a month the, the president, they, um, you know, go to the streets and pick up the dirt uh, with the people and make sure everything is clean. So it's an example of servant leadership uh, that's that's really so necessary in Africa. Uh, so uh, yeah, for me, it's a it's a whole combination of a mindset change um, with the capacity, increasing the capacity of that country to develop. Um, and the moment you've got that, it's a one-one combination, and we can certainly learn a lot from that. Thank you. Uh, coming back to your field. Uh are there any exciting gaps within your field? Yeah, there are. Um, I mean, economics is a, is a field that's uh, evolving the whole time. Uh, there's all kinds of new developments, uh, especially now. Uh, in the current situation, after the, the, the global uh, pandemic and the lockdown and all of that happened, um, you know, um, although the economy globally went through a very difficult time and still many countries are recovering, um, and trying to catch up. Um, uh, I think it has uh, opened new thinking in terms of decentralizing economies, especially in the West, uh, where you've got more market-based economies, um, so that it's not as dependent on state support or on certain structural factors in the economy, that it's more decentralized, self-sustainable, uh, even self-sustainable communities, uh, uh, including the move towards green energy, the move towards smart villages, smart cities. Um, you know, these are the new kind of thinking that are tremendous research opportunities because um, it has to do with systemic change. Um, now, part of the reason why I wrote my book on the inclusive economy um, is um, there are um, um, uh, systemic challenges with regards to capitalism, the kind of capitalism in the West. There's a lot of exploitation, there's a lot of inequality being created. Uh, I think the, the, the pandemic situation has exposed many, much of that. Um, so we need to rethink capitalism as a system. And uh, with the book, uh, The Inclusive Economy, um, uh, many of the principles that are strongly advocated in Africa, linked to Ubuntu, uh, you know, collectivist thinking, uh, sharing economy principles, um, these are actually the solutions to the problems that the West have with the system of capitalism. Um, now, uh, it still promotes a market-based system, but we need to address that through collectivist thinking and collaboration. You know, and I think Africa actually has a solution. So it's, it's beautiful actually that, uh, these are presenting new research opportunities, 
because something uh, Africa has a lot to offer. Um, and then you've got developments in the East where suddenly you've got a very successful Chinese economy that is more socialist, um, you know, and uh, um, there are also lessons to learn from that. Um, and then the whole thinking, aren't there ways to learn from the socialist societies and systems um, and maybe combine that with capitalist thinking? I know it's uh, to opposite systems, but aren't there some synergies? Um, I know the World Economic Forum is even saying that maybe the Chinese model is an example. I myself is a bit concerned that if we talk about socialism in the sense of, uh, you know, centralized resources and the centralized control and power, uh, that's for me a dangerous thing. And I don't think even Africa should go in that direction. But, um, you know, instead of communism, there is a concept called communalism which is a powerful concept because that has to do with Ubuntu in its essence. Um, and that's ways in which one can then um, almost re redefine current economic systems with that kind of uh, inclusive thinking. Um, and then maybe just the last point uh, in terms of research uh, opportunities um, is the big, let's say, geopolitical global economic shift that's taking place. Um, now with the Russian invasion of Ukraine, we see an eastern power block of countries uh, standing up very much linked to, you know, uh, China and India, this economic success there, with the BRICS countries expanding. Uh, the, that possibility is now real. They are considering, I think, 21 or 24 other countries joining the, the uh, BRICS and then uh, to then uh, have develop a new reserve currency for at least the eastern countries uh, to replace the dollar. And that has tremendous implications for the U.S. economy because currently about 80% of world trade uh, takes place in dollars. So the moment there is a new re reserve currency, um, you know, and uh, uh, the demand for dollars decrease, the, the value of the dollar is going to decrease. I mean, many of the uh, oil, most of the oil, and you know, is being sold in dollars. It's the old petrodollar argument, and the Russians and the Chinese wants to replace that. Uh, so it puts South Africa right in the middle of East and West. But um, uh, it's worth, uh, you know, uh, re doing research about it in terms of the implications for the West and the U.S. Um, and then on the other hand, you know, the new power uh, base in the East and how that's going to reshape the, the international economic landscape. Um, so it's going to be very interesting, but these are the things that one will have to investigate. Thank you, Doctor. From your observation, uh, what impact does artificial intelligence has on the field of economics? Mm. AI is a major, major topic. I'm telling you, um, if, if one of the, you know, I, I, I say to people, if, if 2020, the year 2020 was uh, like a reality shock to people in terms of the global lockdown, then 2023 is where the new reality takes shape. The one is what I said about the new geopolitical uh, power block in the East rising up and, and becoming much more forward in terms of the agenda, replacing the dollar. Um, that that changes uh, the global reality, literally, especially if that fully takes effect. And maybe with that, the central bank digital currencies, um, you know, that's that are being uh, developed by central banks across the world, you know, um, which is also an interesting development. And maybe you can link it to AI. Um, um, uh, but then AI itself, we now see chat, GPT, we see all these kinds of, uh, you know, AI becoming more personalized, becoming much more integrated in human day-to-day uh, -day life. Uh, you know, we know about the fourth industrial revolution promoted by the World Economic Forum um, and the Internet of Things. So the, the, the way in which uh, different technologies become more integrated, uh, you know, they talk about the singularity. Um, where different technologies combine in shaping a new reality, as it were, you know, um, uh, is very interesting uh, because it changes economic systems. It changes how the economy functions. 
I mean, in very simple terms, just the, the lockdown, how everything is, uh, transactions more online, uh, more distance orientated, the people can now order things, it's being delivered at your home, you know, uh, lesser need for people to go to the shops and the places. So those are at the basic level changes, but once AI kicks in fully, uh, you know, um, it, it's going to reshape uh, economies and also open up new economic uh, opportunities. Uh, just yesterday I was looking at, for instance, uh, there is a student group in, I think it's Ireland, that developed a system called the, the, the Food Cloud, where they integrate uh, food distribution systems with AI um, and link that to the needs of the people, needs of communities. So what they do is they, they, they address the, the, the amounts of food being wasted and they make sure it gets to people who need it and then uh, de deal with the hunger issue, deal with the poverty issue, uh, deal with the inequality issue because inequality to a large extent is because of the lack of uh, redistribution and distribution systems. You know, so it's, so it's interesting how technology and technological capabilities uh, are opening up new thinking in terms of problem solving uh, with tangible, practical, uh, you know, results uh, dealing with the, the hunger crisis. And the moment you deal with that uh, human aspect, uh, you know, in terms of basic needs, it empowers people and it creates new opportunities for people in communities. I mean, in the book, for instance, I talk about um, extending the supply chains in terms of how inclusive businesses can operate, how you can actually start using the problems in your community, like the waste and the plastic and the, all of that as an additional component to your value chain, and in that way generate jobs, generate uh, out of problems new solutions, you know, and then integrate more people into the economy. You know, these things are, um, you know, so incredible in terms of opportunities. Um, and I think, especially in Africa, um, you know, um, the opportunity is there. And now you've got the technological capability through AI to support this, to facilitate this, to put the intelligence into the system so that, uh, you know, uh, it can aid people in terms of... Um, uh, you know, making better decisions and putting better systems in place. But of course, there's the fear, you know, how far should we go? Because AI, you know, um, if it does its own thinking and it becomes what is called sentient, you know, um, uh, the fear is it might do so much thinking for us that, uh, you know, we become inferior to this technology uh, and we can't control it. Uh, so these are, I think, invalid questions and uh, yeah so uh, as with anything there are many good things but you need to know where to draw the line yes, uh, you know the limitations <laughs> um, and uh, but it's I think all of this is part of things that can be researched that can be studied comparative analysis being made so uh, it lends itself to a lot of uh, research opportunities thank you very much what can you say to aspiring researchers Oh, yes. Um, I can say to them uh, that now is the best time to dig into all kinds of research opportunities. I mean, the landscape is changing by the day. Uh, I think um, uh, when you've got a lot of change out there, um, uh, that in itself presents itself as good research opportunities because you can compare, you can anticipate, you can... Uh, hypothetically test certain things that is being anticipated, new developments, new innovation on the horizon, um, changes uh, in, for in my case, the economy on a daily basis, uh, you know, new systems. Um, so I think the changes, uh, uh, you know, in this, let's say, fourth industrial revolution, which might have been announced by Chad GPT, uh, get, uh, getting on the forefront, uh, you know, really, um, uh, it creates new opportunities. So, um, and I think especially for the younger generation, new researchers, um, you know, many of it is linked to innovative developments. And I think we need more research in order to do some of these comparative analysis and to, 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 um, you know, to, to identify the trends and, uh, um, you know, in a way, just see, um, you know, 
um, um, how are things changing uh, realities and also creating new opportunities. Uh, you know, research, um, the benefit of research, I think, is to improve society in order to make us to, to act, um, accelerate progress, you know, and uh, if there's one thing we need in Africa, it's progress because we have, uh, you know, uh, almost like a digital gap to many of the other countries and also, uh, you know, there's inequality challenges. So um, I think uh, the opportunity is, is, is there and then with globalization, you've got more um, opportunities to collaborate with other countries, researchers in so many countries. So, uh, because the world's getting smaller, and uh, in that sense, it creates much more opportunities. Thank you so much, Tom. And then, apart from research, what are you, what are your interests? Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, well, I never lost my love for sports. Um, so, um, this being a World Cup year and uh, uh, rugby, um, cricket, tennis, my boys are playing uh, tennis. Um, they are doing so well, and I, I also love ten, playing tennis. So sports is absolutely on my heart. Uh, even football, I love uh, all kinds of sports. So, uh, um, and then uh, you know, uh, just some family time. I'm a big uh, supporter of, of, of family and uh, good family time together. Uh, my wife is also a lecturer here at the university at the law faculty. And, uh, yeah, so, uh, spending lots of family time and, uh, yeah, and then, uh, my passion for community, rebuilding communities. Uh, you know, I think, um, the, 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 the heartbeat of South Africa and Africa is how we bring the people together. And once we do that effectively, you know, I think the, the potential is en endless to, to, uh, to rebuild communities and, uh, you know, people struggle with so many things. It's when we get together and come together, work together, that we start um, healing the wounds of the past and then also build a new future, you know. So these things can happen. And I think uh, my passion is really uh, for that as well, to bring our people together, to be, um, you know, an instrument of change uh, in the good sense of the word and to, to serve our communities. Um, and this is across the, the country. Uh, you know, I had the opportunity to speak in Sharpville some time ago, um, and, uh, you know, it was so amazing. So we're setting up food gardens there. Um, we are starting things to, 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 you know, develop that community. We are uh, putting security systems in place, you know, to safeguard those communities, all these kind of things. And, you know, it's, it's a privilege for me to, to, to serve and those kind of communities and to take hands, to bring stakeholders together, you know. Uh, so my passion is to see our people uh, being united for the right reasons and to start rebuilding the nation. Okay. Thank you very much, Doctor. We see that now you are plowing back to the communities and we are very thankful for that. And then thank you for sharing with us. Thank, thank you, you so, so much. much. Thank you. <laughs>